Hey guys, and welcome to the Lunge and Lift podcast. Hopefully these smooth tones are coming through your ears now from our new latest addition to the podcast. Asher and myself have invested in a proper mic setup and a uh, little spit cover thing. So uh, it should be nice and smooth. Hopefully it sounds a lot better than previous episodes. Ash, how are you? I'm very well, mate. Thank you. Ooh, those tones. <laughs> <laughs> So, so today, guys, we uh, want to kind of continue on with our uh, continuum podcast. So we've obviously been discussing aesthetics a lot recently. We've touched on like, muscle building, fat loss, and a few other areas. And we want to kind of direct this now into the performance world and kind of cover a few topics there. So, so Ash, just, let's have a quick recap on previous uh, aesthetic episodes. So if you haven't listened to them, what, what will have our listeners missed? If you have missed them, definitely turn back, back time and yeah, check them out. There's a lot of good information there. But the key takeaways for muscle gain uh, from a training perspective, if you're looking to grow muscle, it needs to be hard training. The actual quantifiable metrics aren't that important by contrast to the performance stuff, which we're about to talk about. The key things you want to focus on are time under tension, so doing tempo work, increasing the volume, so you're just doing more work overall, looking for that, um, what most people would talk about as lactic acid burn, just building up the acid in the muscles as you go through a set, making it feel really uncomfortable, and increasing the tension going through the muscles. That means working hard and lifting heavier. They are the key things that will tell your body to pack on a little bit more muscle. Um, from a fat loss point of view, from a training perspective, it's all about burning more calories. But in the fat loss training episode, we dive into why it's a good idea to create a business case for your body to hang on to its muscle. It keeps your metabolism higher, so you burn more calories inside and outside of the gym but you also will develop a better looking physique as you lean out because you'll hang on to that lean muscle mass which gives the toned look which a lot of people are <laughs> going for or just like the muscular look uh, for people who want to look a little bit bigger um, when we bring it to nutrition relatively simple on the surface in that mm. if you want to put on muscle you need to be eating more than you're burning and if you want to lose weight, you need to be eating less than you're burning. Uh, we go into the nuances of how you might approach that in the nutrition episodes. Uh, but the key point for both is to track something that you care about, whether that is through body scans, where you're looking at your body fat percentage and lean muscle mass. It might just be as simple as photos to see how your body looks different over time. And the old school way of using the scales does still have a place to see whether your body mass is going up or down. And you can use a combination of all three to get a good overall picture as to whether you need to change your training or nutrition strategy to course correct. Yeah, How's that? I think I think that's perfect, mate. It really is. And just to reiterate that point, what gets measured gets managed. And yeah. it's people kind of talk about the obsessive nature maybe of tracking macros or uh, tracking your weight daily and stuff like that but the thing is if you have daily stats whether that is a weight or whether that's um, uh, your macronutrients that you hit on the day it means when you get to the end of the week you can have an overview of how you performed over a week rather than a snapshot in time and it's like you may need to go through say a month or two of tracking macros one to learn about nutrition yourself get an understanding of what foods actually what macronutrients are in certain foods but also understand how much you're eating. So like as in how many calories, what does say two and a half thousand calories actually feel like? So, mm -hmm. and if you, if you're just ballparking all the time, you just don't know. And then it's really hard to then make adjustments when you're say weight stools or whatever the case may be. But as I said, uh, definitely go back, check out those episodes. We really go into some good information there. So this was just a little bit of a, a recap for those that may have missed uh, those episodes. So Ash uh, performance, I mm. think, this is a really interesting one because uh, when it comes to performance, the definition can get blurred at times. I think it's people sometimes say, oh, I'm, I'm training for performance or I'm eating for performance, but they don't really know what they're performing for. Yeah. And they, 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 they have the misunderstanding sometimes that, say, doing CrossFit as an example, how it's a performance-based 
say sport in a way even if you're doing it recreationally um it, they get the misunderstanding that they're going for fat loss so they're doing using crossfit as a thing and then they're saying oh well i'm eating for performance when it's okay you're not you need to really define your um your why and your your reason for going to the the crossfit classes as an example so so actually just dive a little bit more into that yeah for sure i think with everything it's clear to define the terms of your yeah your training goals essentially so if you want to train for performance what are you performing in and in what context are you performing are you looking to be a competitive athlete and go to competitions and perform at the, at the sport of crossfit overall or are you just looking to be fitter by certain metrics for your own personal satisfaction so that could be the difference between um, measuring your performance in the crossfit open where you rank yourself against all the other crossfitters in the world doing the open or it could be adding some kilos to the bar in a certain lift or unlocking a movement or adding reps to a movement just for personal satisfaction and unless you're clear on how you want to perform it's very difficult to determine how you should train for performance and also eat like it's very different to mm. eat uh when you're training to perform in the crossfit games versus weightlifting for example like they're both yeah. performance goals but you would eat differently yeah that'd be obviously um we've spoken with liam before and it'd be great to get back on because he's had such a good experience when it comes to performance nutrition you know working from crossfit athletes footballers and uh, uh, triathletes and more so we really will dive deep into that nutrition side of things because it can be a bit of a um a challenging thing that's now i think you know when we obviously spoke there about how simple it can be say for muscle gain and fat loss mm. in like as look as an overview real simple overview but when it does come to performance nutrition i think that really does become a lot more specific and that's where you know the the couple of extra grams here a couple of extra grams there make a big difference and that's then when the tracking and the measurements and all that really make a big thing. And that differentiates, I guess, the thing of when it is done recreationally. So say, for instance, when we're talking about, say, our general gym goers that want to perform better, say they want mm. to get their first ring muscle up. So that's their performance goal. Now, their nutrition might not necessarily um, support to get your best, uh, to get a ring muscle up, but then they'll be doing a skill-based performance uh, mm. goal. Now, we uh when we was touching on the uh performance the difference between the two types as you said there we have the work in competition which is you are training obviously for a specific date so say for instance or say a football game or anything like that so if we're talking about footballers you're going to be your when you're training for performance there you're going to be learning the skills you're going to be improving your free kicks you're going to be improving your penalties uh, your running meters on the pitch, all those type of things. So you're going to be trying to improve on certain metrics. And then obviously, so then that's your training for, for performance. And then you're going to bring your best performance possible to then your football game itself. Mm -hmm. So then you you perform at your highest capacity there, uh, but then you obviously you can't um, control the team that turns up to play against you. So your performance might not be enough to win on the day, but you still have bought your best performance. And then you can obviously look at, okay, where could I not perform to my highest ability? And that's now a new target to start working towards and start ticking off the list. And that's where it comes uh, when with performance. It's about understanding your controllables and being able to say when you're in the gym, you're in or wherever you train, you have control of everything say around you, hopefully. And you, able, you know, control your environment, the music and all that lot. So your performance goals and your performance outcomes are a lot cleaner because, you, yeah. you know, you, you can like it. I think if we touch on like, you know, with you and the one arm pull up, I think that's a really perfect example. You how long was you working for the one arm pull up? Varies to, depending who you ask, but <laughs> I would say a year and a half gunning for it directly. And okay. maybe a year before that, I was doing some as accessory for my strict muscle up goal. Um, so you've yeah. been grafting it for a while. So there you go. So, that, yeah. so your performance goal of a one arm pull up and you finally hit it the other day for the first time. Did. did you get it on both arms? I think. No. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Just, just checking. Just checking. Yeah. Um, no, but honestly, that was that that showed you. But all your training has been geared towards that performance. Mm. 
Mm. You haven't necessarily been eating for the one arm pull up. Not really, no. I think well, when I did WIT 30, the uh, the dietary challenge, and I was in a muscle gain group, and I put on six kilos, I'd say I was eating <laughs> directly against single arm pull up performance. But uh, yeah, I don't think I I didn't consciously try and cut weight. It came off very slowly after the uh, after WIT 30. I did go back to eating my normal way, and was hoping that I dropped back to my normal weight sooner than I did, which made the training a bit harder. But uh, no, I I was quite, I thought that if I did a massive cut, it would kind of be cheating a little bit. I wanted to. Yeah. You wanted to be legit, yeah. get there based on your strength and the body weight that you are there rather than yeah. just being better because you're lighter. Exactly. I, I think when you, so as an eating for performance goal, eating for your performance would probably be, as you say, would be more of a diet rather than actually mm. I'm going to need to fuel the workout because it's like the workout mm. itself, you're, you're doing your, say, accessory pieces to build a one-up, but your output of the sessions are quite low, right? Relatively, quite yeah. Very relatively, high skill. Yeah, exactly. So it's relatively low, uh, low energy expenditure, but high neurological demand. And to be fair, I think I actually did start adding more carbs pre-workout over lockdown. I just found that training in the afternoon, I felt a little bit better having had some carbs at lunch. Uh, so that's, I, could, I would say, a performance tweak. And because I was running as well, I increased carbs in my diet overall just because I was burning more uh yeah burning more energy than just doing gymnastics like strict gymnastics and some strict strength stuff which I was doing previously which is all very low expenditure <laughs> um, so yeah I think that's a nice example of uh, training and eating for performance yeah. one thing I wanted to come back to on your example for football is a really good point for defining performance training is when you have a complex field sport like football whenever you're pursuing performance you're right in that it's very important to define some metrics to track progress and improve on but when you're playing against another team the, the only thing that counts is the score and the result of the game so if you're focused on your vertical jump or your 5k running time or how quickly you can recover from intervals they could all be going up, but you still lose the match. Yeah. So a major challenge for defining performance training is coming up with relevant metrics, which will transfer over to performance in the game. And it's very difficult because depending on who the competition is, say you look at pass completion, you can have great pass completion against team A, but terrible pass completion against team B because they're just more organized mm. so how do you set up your training to factor in those uncontrollable mm. variables and I think as a performance coach that's one of the major challenges for those complex sports and even in the top teams you hear about stories where their performance might be set, like in training they'll be applauded because their leg press strength has gone up and it's like that doesn't carry <laughs> no. over to football especially not a competitive match like no. the guy on the pitch with the biggest leg press numbers probably isn't the best player no. but it's still something that they pursue yeah I think it's just a very interesting topic of conversation of how do you actually distill the key metrics because you could track a million things in football yeah. And what are the ones that actually matter to improve this player's performance? Because for one, it could be his fitness. The other, it could be his speed. It could be his skill and accuracy. And getting clear on what the key ones are for an individual athlete can unlock hu like huge leaps in actual on-pitch performance, which I think yeah. is the, yeah, the thing that actually matters. Exactly. Whereas you know, a sport like weightlifting it's a lot simpler it's like is the snatch better is the clean and jerk better yes. but as long as they make the lift it doesn't yeah. matter if it looks pretty or not and that's the thing is like it's 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 that in in that respect they they have full control of what the person they are they turn up whether they're good in competition or not that's still down to them that's their control they can get better mm. at uh, performing in competition and you know it's just it might not be your day but then that's you know that was down to you and your lack of performance, shall we say, rather than anyone else's. Whereas when it comes to like a team sport or you're against someone else, obviously in the say a weightlifting thing, someone might lift more than you. Then it just means you need to get stronger. 
Mm. You know, that's just the unfortunate nature of there are people stronger than you and you can't be the strongest at everything. Otherwise there would be, there would be no strongest person. So yeah. it's the, the, the big thing of understanding the difference between competition performance and personal performance, I think is the key thing that we kind of wanted to get across at the start before we dive deeper into subjects, because they get very blurred those two lines and it's because the performance training overall a lot of the time has a competition thought behind it mm. even though it's not always co- even if it's competition against yourself it's yeah. that's where which in a way that is but it's when you take it to a, a level where you're competing against others that's then when you know that's you have to understand the the controllables there that you are bringing the best performance you can Mm. And the outcome isn't necessarily always going to be favorable. So, but that's, that's, that's what the main thing I think you need to, like, we want the listeners to take away from with performance, because when it comes to CrossFit overall, I know we're obviously talking about football there, but when you bring it back to CrossFit, it's in like in a gym setting, in a class setting where you're, you're doing a, say a gymnastics workout or a, a, a cardio based workout, you're on your salt bike doing an EMOM, say, and you have to try and hit say, a certain amount of calories in a minute. So that's a performance. So is that you can get better at that because that's a measurable target. Can I hit 15 calories every minute, say for 10 minutes? So you can work on that and then you can get better and better and better at that. But then if you put that into a competition environment where there's then others, mm. then you might not be that good on here so by because they can say do 20 calories in the same time you can do 15. And that's not your problem. That just means you still have room to grow. You still have room to perform better. Yeah. But that's the thing. But you then need to be happy with yourself and the the outcome of you hitting 50 cal- 15 calories every minute for for 10 minutes that that is a performance goal that you've met and i think really um having those performance goals yourself and having a, a real understanding of your like why you're doing something and mm-hmm. what your actual goals are is so important when it comes to performance because they can get blurred so easy by other people's performance yeah i think that's a nice point um to contrast performance versus aesthetics and it would be interesting to ask you we haven't mm-hmm. planned this so it's putting you on the spot <laughs> but when you transitioned from doing bodybuilding which at a show somebody else is validating how good you are at body- bodybuilding by their opinion on your physique into crossfit and strength where it's objective like it's a, a strength for sure like if you pull a heavy deadlift as long as the weights are legit you've pulled a heavy deadlift and Mm -hmm. no one can argue with it and I'd just be interested to get your thoughts on how different it feels to have your I guess you've got a lot more control of the outcome when you're doing performance training and in terms of satisfaction like I think a lot of bodybuilding uh, is around getting acceptance from other people whereas performance training is typically more internally validated like i feel satisfied that i can now do this type thing yeah i mean when it comes to like the aesthetic side of things is in i felt that when so i when i did my last uh, bodybuilding show it was like a six months diet six month six month diet and um you know i worked hard for it i did as much as i can and i turned up on the day and i definitely felt i was top two um, and I definitely feel the person that beat me did beat him because he was at a little bit leaner. So I, I I would say my performance there was exactly what I deserved. I deserved second place because even I thought the person that beat me beat me. So that was mm-hmm. a nice clear cut. Whereas if I felt that I was at a little bit more, say, leaner around my glutes and stuff like that, that was where the difference was. That's that's where you could see like the leanness in the glutes. <laughs> that's that's, a, that, that's the, the level that that was getting to. And, you know, I was happy enough to say, forgo that and so by the end of it i was like you know what i'm happy with my performance there but when it comes to like the the crossfit side and the strength training it's been such a as you say it's internally rewarding Mm. and but but on the flip side to that because i'm then relatively strong Mm. i always feel i have to perform Mm -hmm. you know what i mean so i can't go to say say for instance in like a say a class environment and it's not really, it's not my day, so I'm not really feeling that. But then other people are lifting, this is just my problem. Like, it's like other people are lifting heavy and I'm, like, I'm stronger than that person. I need to now lift more than that. So it can actually be a little bit more of a detriment for me, like the training for performance side of things, that like that actually then, 
we've spoke about this in previous podcasts, but staying in your own lane and like, you know, focusing on who you are that day and understanding the, the bigger picture. Yeah. I often get side row, uh, side rail and like look at other people. I'm like, fuck, I need to beat that person. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, it's, that's then the internal, that's a, that's a weird, as you say about like, the validation, like it's kind of funny that I didn't necessarily have that validation issue with bodybuilding, but I think that's because my love of bodybuilding wasn't as much as my love for strength and performance, like that side of thing. So I think I had more competitive, mm. like I want to be the best in that side of things. And I also, yeah. I'm also the type of person where I want to, you look at me and you think, oh, he's a big lad. I bet he can't do, say, some gymnastics type thing. And I'll go and do a load of ring muscle ups or bar muscle ups. And I can be like, fuck me, I didn't expect that. Or handstand walks. And it's the doing the unexpected. Yeah. So that, that, that's the internal, like, like fire that fires me but then also the 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 shock factor other people that wouldn't expect that so mm. that's like that's like an external factor so it's like i like i like training for my ego which is <laughs> and that's to put it bluntly you know i like yeah. i like to i like to live and that's why every time i try and say just do like aesthetic style training to to know you to say working towards a say a body composition goal i always get like derailed and end up lifting like three rms and shit because like, it's just is what i love to do so yeah. it's, it's it's making sure of having that balance and always coming back to my why and my say my performance goals might be cool my performance is to get to a certain body weight so that's what that performance is it's not necessarily in an actual uh an output number on a thing mm-hmm. but it's actually it's a it's a number on a say a scale so that's mm-hmm. just my internal performance so uh, which is, is it's not it's not the same and I, I i don't really i can't I'm not trying to cast aesthetic training and the sex stuff as performance but i'm just talk, talking more about my own like self-performance so. yeah the internal drive yeah yeah i think that's it i think there's always an element of both uh for both aesthetics and performance in terms of internal and external validation and yeah i think it's just always interesting where it comes from in terms of Comp- your competitive nature mm. and your points of comparison like what you think you should be able to do and whether you think it's impressive yeah. or not and it would be very easy and simple to say that aesthetics is externally validated because it's how you look to other people but actually some people just like to look a certain way for their own satisfaction yeah. and on the flip side when it comes to performance you would think that it's internally driven because you're impressed with yourself that you can do something but actually you're hoping that you impress other people as well <laughs> by being yeah. able to do something and perform. Yeah. So and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. I think that's, that's, that's a it's big natural. thing. I think it's like, if you want to become the strongest person in the room, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that, that's, that's a massive ego thing. That is in no way. Can you say that's like, Oh, I'm just doing it. Cause no, no, you, there's nothing wrong with that. Just become the strongest. That is completely fine. And if you're not the strongest person in the room, become the strongest person and that should be your goal even if you will never be the strongest but that's why i always enjoyed it so when um when i trained out of uh, like commercial gyms and stuff like that say virgin where i was at i was the strongest person at that gym so but then as soon as i then go into the, like the crossfit sphere i then wasn't and mm. that's i was always say strong but i loved that because then that, that gave me a new that's why i loved like gymnastics and stuff like that because it, i was not necessarily the best at that at all i was so far from that so it was in the constant battle to get better yeah so then that was the internal drive because then i wasn't the strongest i wasn't the best and because the thing with crossfit it goes across so many domains it's performances on mul- multiple levels mm. that it's so hard to become good at everything and yeah. so that, that's what i loved about it and that was the, that was the difference and i felt that's why i think i fell in love with say crossfit say training originally was because of that competitive element mm. but then obviously i then take a couple of steps back just where it then didn't become as much of a drive for me anymore the, the performance side of it so because yeah i kind of done my thing so yeah but i think what would be um what would be really nice is to kind of give our listeners a bit of an overview of what's coming up because we've got some really cool podcasts that we want to dive into, especially in this performance series. So obviously we just want to do a bit of an overview episode here and kind of define our definition of performance and make the the differences there. But we are hoping, well, we are going to be having an episode on the the nutrition side of performance. We're going to uh, dive deep into the mindset side of things. And we're also training for performance and a bit more of the specifics. And I think that's where 
we're going to really dive deep into um like especially with crossfit and and sports and so forth anything else ash <clears throat> yeah i think that's it we're just excited to talk about the nuances for different types of performance because depending on which sport you're training for it can be very very different like at its simplest training for strength versus like endurance or mm. like a more traditional view of fitness versus a high skill sport and crossfit's a great uh, topic of discussion because it crosses all of those different areas yeah. and uh then yeah hopefully we'll we'll get into some some more uh, niche sports where it's a uh, a little less um traditional strength and conditioning gym based stuff and how would you increase your performance in something like golf for example because it yeah. I, like i think we might have slightly different uh, views on that to the traditional yeah. approach to yeah so we look forward to diving into those and of course so we obviously still have to record these episodes so if there is anything you'd like to, for us to dive into your specific sport or anything like that do drop us a message on instagram uh, or on uh, our email address is just contact at lungeonlift.com um, so if you want us to chat maybe a bit more about your sport get in contact and we'll see what we can do but apart from that, we hope our sound quality has really um, upped the game a little bit for us. And uh, we really want to invest in uh, the podcast itself because the reviews and feedback we've been getting has been great. And so we really appreciate all of that. And uh, obviously, if you do want to leave us feedback, you know, you can find us on iTunes and stuff like that. You can leave a little comment there. We'd appreciate that. Um, but apart from that, thank you very much for your time. And, and uh, we appreciate that. And we'll see you guys on our next episode. Thanks, guys.